You folks are going to have to bear with me this morning. My pastor from Thornton is here. I know he's going to be taking notes. He used to come check on me when I'd preach other places around Thornton, and then later I had to hear about it. But I'm glad he's here. Brother Tracy Sims and his wife Claire are here, and what a blessing they are in my life, I want you to know. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 15. I think it's interesting that uh, Brother Tracy was going to be here today, and I had a tough week, and I was trying to, to prepare, and it doesn't seem to me to be just a coincidence that I settled on the prodigal son. You know, because in many ways, Brother Tracy can tell you I'm kind of the prodigal son. But I'm glad that Jesus loves me. I'm glad that he saved me. I'm glad that he changed me. I'm glad that he uses me. And I have a blessed hope today. Have you ever lost something that's valuable? Not too long ago, I went and got in the car. And my eyes are very sensitive. And the first thing I do when I go to get in the car is I grab my sunglasses. And I went looking for my sunglasses. They're normally in a certain spot in the car, and they weren't in their spot. And so I couldn't leave until I got my sunglasses. So I left and went in the house, and I rummaged through the house, and I rummaged through the bedroom, and I rummaged through the kitchen, and I went out to the carport, and I looked everywhere that I could look for my sunglasses, and as I bent over, they fell off my head. Have you ever lost something? Drives you crazy. We are blessed that the housing project that's going on right next to the church with D.R. Horton Homes, they have allowed us to supply them with greeting baskets for everyone who buys a new home. So they're receiving a greeting basket from Rock Prairie Baptist Church. So this week, Kathleen and I and Brother Steve loaded up the greeting baskets in Kathleen's car, and we took off over to the sales office to deliver the greeting baskets to D.R. Horton Homes. And we carried those baskets in, and Brother Steve went out and got in his car, and he went driving off, and Kathleen and I went out and got in her car, and all of a sudden, she just sits there kind of quiet. And I looked over, I said, Kathleen, something wrong? And she said, I don't know where my keys are. How can you not know where your keys are? We just drove over here. We just parked. She's looking everywhere. I get out of the car. I'm searching through the back seat. I'm starting to go lift up the back. Brother Steve stopped because he realized we weren't moving and rolled down his window and said, something wrong? He said, we can't find the keys. We're searching frantically for those keys until Kathleen says, they're in my coat pocket. There's nothing worse than losing something of value and not being able to find it. I read a story about a man that ran a, a rather large company, and he needed to speak to a, one of his employees about a very important issue, so he called him on the phone. When he called, the voice of a little boy answered the phone, real, real quiet and soft. The little boy says, hello? And the man says, son, is your father there? The little boy says, yes. He said, well, may I speak with him, please? And the little boy said, no. So the man was a little perturbed, and he said, well, is your, is your mother there? And the little boy says, yes. He said, well, can I speak to your mother? And the little boy says, no. So now the man is really besides himself, and he figures, well, if mom and dad are not available, someone must be there watching the child. He said, is there anybody else there with you? And the little boy says, yes. He said, well, who's there with you? And he said, a policeman. He said, well, can I talk to the policeman? And the little boy said, no. He said, well, why can't I talk to the policeman? The little boy said, he's talking to the fireman. So now the man's really worried. He says, oh, no, you've got a policeman there. You've got a fireman there. Can I talk to the fireman? The little boy says, no. He said, well, why can't I talk to the fireman? He said, because he's helping the helicopter land. 
The man says, a helicopter? Good Lord, now you've got a helicopter there? He said, what, what are they doing there with the policeman and the fireman and the helicopter? And the little voice giggled and said, looking for me? <laughs> There's a terrible thing to have something lost that needs to be found. I remember I have a business partner in El Paso many years ago, a business that we had together, and we had bought an airplane. And I had learned to fly the airplane because I was handling the sales for the company and I would travel around quite an extensive area. But my partner, and thank God, Tanny loved me, but he worried about me. He didn't have quite as much faith in my piloting ability as I did. And one late evening, I was supposed to leave El Paso, and I was going to fly to Midland. And so Tanny took me to the airport and left, and I think I decided I needed something to eat or something, so I didn't take off right away. I went and got me something to eat. Well, little did I know, my partner is counting down the time that I should land in Midland. And he had told me before I left, he said, now make sure and call me and let me know that you got to Midland all right. So I was a little delayed getting to Midland because I wasn't really in a hurry. But I remember when I was making my approach to Midland, and I had called in to the Midland tire, Tower to Midland Approach, and Midland responded to me, 4367 X-ray, you are cleared to land runway 18 right. And I dutifully answered, 4367 X-ray, roger. And then right behind that, the tower comes on and says, Cherokee 4367 X-ray, be advised that immediately upon landing runway 18 right, you are to call the tower on the landline. I had no idea. That's not a good thing, y'all. It's not a good thing. So I taxied down to the fixed-based operator, and I got out of the, the airplane, and I went inside, and I said, you know, do you have the number to the tower? And they said, sure, and I called over to the tower, and I told the man who I was, and he said, ha, oh, so you're the one. I said, what, what, sir, what do you mean? I'm the one. You're the one that's been lost. I said, been lost? No, sir, I just flew in from El Paso. He said, do you know someone named Tanny Berg? And I went, oh, no. Lord, no. And Tanny, when I had not called him in time, had called the FAA. And they had notified the Midland Tower that I was a missing aircraft. And that was not a good thing. Not a good thing. It's a horrible thing when something's lost and needs to be found. Our text this morning tells us about things that are of value to our Lord, that are prized possessions. And the most prized possession that he holds is people. God loves people. He loves big people, small people, short people, tall people, smart people, dumb people, red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. God's love for mankind exceeds our very imagination. Stronger than anything that we could ever think of. It's beyond the universe that he created. It's bigger than the galaxy as you look out and you look across the sky and you see the stars. God's love is greater than that galaxy. It's bolder than the horizons and the sunrise in the morning and the sunset in the evening. It's broader than the transgressions of my sin. It's brilliant in its scope. It's a precious love and a priceless love and a protective love. And our text this morning in Luke chapter 15 tells us that God's love creates his lost and found. I am so glad that there's a lost and found department in God's kingdom. So as we read in Luke chapter 15 this morning, I'm going to skip across a few verses that are going to have particular significance to our message this morning. I'll begin with verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? Then skip down to verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, 
doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. Now go down to verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Skip down now to verse 20. And when he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And now go down to verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and grace and mercy, and thank you for your precious word. And I pray, Father, that you would take your word and that you would sink it deep into our soul and our spirit this morning, and that we would know your love. And I ask it in the name that's high above every other name, the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our text this morning is three stories in one parable. In verse 3, the scripture says, he spake this parable to them. But there are actually three stories, and let's define the characters that are told about in this particular story. First of all, we have the lost sheep. That's given to us in verse 4. The lost sheep represents those in society that are absent from the Savior, and therefore they're abiding in danger. Lost sheep are in peril. They're prey for predators. Their progression is a precarious position. They're in a predicament without the provisions of the protection of Christ Jesus. They're helpless, they're hapless, and they're homeless. They're exposed to the elements, the lost sheep. But also we're told about the lost silver. We find that in verse 8. What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it? Silver is a symbol that has great value. But I want you to pay particular attention to that scripture because it lets us know that the silver coin was not lost in the weeds of the world. It was lost in the house. We see something valuable for us to learn, that things of great value can be lost in the house. You see, when we're lost, we're out of God's hand. And when we're out of God's hand, we are no longer a part of his plan. We become useless and unfit. We're unused. We're unseen. We're unfortunate. We're unproductive. When money is lost, the actual metal of the coin itself might be lost. But listen, we lose all of the potential that that money could have bought. Everything that it could have procured, every good that it could have done for someone else is lost. It's not a matter of the piece of metal and the coin. The potential for the use of the coin is no longer valid. And loved one, it's the same in your life and it's the same in my life because we can be lost in the house. And when we're lost in the house, we're of no value to Christ. When that money is lost, it can procure nothing. It can prevent nothing. It can preserve nothing. And Christians that are lost in service to Jesus Christ are missing currency. They're missing coinage present in the house. Listen to me carefully this morning. We're not saved so that we can sit and soak. We're saved so that we can season and serve. Every one of us should desire to be seasoned. Every one of us should desire to serve, not to sit and soak. Our churches, unfortunately, are full of Christians that make a profession, but they have no possession. 
It's an empty profession. There are lost coins that are in the house. They're invisible. They do nothing. They're inept. They learn nothing. They're insecure because they possess nothing. Their value for Christ is tarnished. Loved ones, just because we come to church, it does not mean that we're connected to Christ. Lost silver in the house. Do we have any lost silver in our house this morning? Is your value unrealized? Are you unsatisfied with your life? Living in the house without hope? But we've seen the lost sheep, and we see the lost silver, but there's also in this story a lost son, a prodigal son. In verse 18, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. My pastor, Brother Tracy, a week or so ago had some surgery. And I went down to Houston to sit with Miss Claire, and when I got there, we were standing and talking, and their son, Josh, come walking up and brought Mom a Starbucks coffee. And I happened to look at Josh, and I said, You know, I'm your prodigal brother. Boy, he loved it. I could see his face, you know, because I'm his prodigal brother since I'm the prodigal son. But this parable represents to us a person, a person who's saved, but they're separated. They have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they have no reliability. Their fellowship with the Father has faltered. They're struggling alone. They're striving apart from grace. They're stuck in apathy. There's some lost sons in the house. Lost sons need restoration. Lost sons need regeneration. So we have one parable with three stories, three possibilities of loss, and three portraits of preservation. God's lost and found is always where grace abounds. Please notice that in this particular passage of Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity are visible in this parable. Look at it in verse 4. The shepherd is the Son of God. He's our seeker. He's our keeper. He's always searching for the lost, and he spares no cost. In verse 8, the woman who lost the coin and searches for it is a type of the Holy Spirit, searching for treasure, seeking the lost, to secure it, to sustain it. And loved ones, there's two significant reasons that we get lost in service. This particular story tells us about the woman lighting a candle and taking a broom and beginning to sweep and look for the valuable coin that had been lost. That's because when we lose our service, it's due to dust and it's due to darkness. The Holy Spirit shines this glorious light of the gospel from without. And he stirs up the dust of contention in our life from within until the lost is found. The lost soul can be outside the fold, but listen to me this morning, a saved Christian can be just as lost. When the Holy Spirit loses touch and direction in our life, our life spins totally out of expectation. The Christian life, out of God's hand, is a soul that's out of God's plan. Salvation is secured, but peace is surrendered. Notice those type people have a loss of dedication to Christ and to his church. They suffer from a lack of consecration. They have no witness. They have a poor testimony. They have a loss of administration because there's no guidance of the Holy Spirit that's in their life. When we come into that situation, we become a tool that's in the toolbox and we're no longer a tool that's in the hand of God to be used. We tend to lose our focus. 
But we are a prime candidate when we come to that point for God's lost and found. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. But in verse 20, we see, as I told you, the Trinity, we see God the Father. In verse 20, it says, He came to His Father, but when He was yet a great way off, His Father saw Him. He had compassion. He ran. He fell on His neck, and He kissed Him. God the Father is always active in His lost and found. He seeks the lost son and the missing silver for reconciliation, for restoration and reconstruction. The father is patient. He's waiting. He's persistent. He's looking. He's prepared. He's prepared to rejoice. I read a a short thing this week in preparation for this message that says, The father thought it. The son brought it. The Holy Spirit wrought it. Glory to God, I got it. In all three of these stories, there's rejoicing when what is lost is found. The poet Larry Bryant wrote, When the Model T first hit the street, it didn't bring all of heaven to its feet. And when the first computer was born, they didn't blow old Gabriel's horn. There's only one thing that we're sure about that can make those angels jump and shout, It's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice, that's when the angels rejoice. Now, heaven doesn't strike up a band for any old occasion at hand. It's got to be a special thing to make those angels smile and sing. Now, when the United States became a nation, there was no angelic celebration. But when one sinner comes back home, they jump for joy around the throne. Lost sheep and lost souls can be found. Lost silver and the lost servant can be found. The lost son who's lost his senses can be found. This is a treble parable about a triune God. Now that we've defined the characters, let's look at the significance of this story. Every part and every parcel of each of the three stories that are contained in this one parable boil down to one fixed foundational principle. God loves you. And God loves me. Romans 8.38 says, I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to celebrate us from the love of God. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord. I can't be separated. Thank you, Father. I can't be lost. Thank you for your lost and found because you love me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love Him. Why? Because He first loved me. Wow. If that doesn't get you going, nothing else can. So we see in this story that love is evident in the lost sheep. In verse 4 and 5, it says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go until he finds it? Listen to me first of all this morning. God's love is a seeking love. I am so glad that Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord, is not a ninety-nine percenter. Almost is not good enough for him. Close is not even in his vocabulary. Nearly will never happen. He seeks, he secures, and he saves always. Notice in verse 4, it says, until he finds it. His mission is always accomplished. It doesn't say that he's hoping to find it. It doesn't say he's wishing or trying to find it. It says he searches until He finds it. He never stops seeking. Until it's a finished search, a fulfilled mission, and a final resolve, he's looking for you and he's looking for me. The lost sheep are safe in God's lost and found. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. But then go to 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Pay attention to this. And that he died for what? All. 
Praise God I'm included in the all. Amen? We're all lost sheep, but we can be part of his all. If we were to take just for illustration purposes the city of College Station, and let's just say for illustration purposes that the population in College Station is 100. Now, if we could say there were 100 people in College Station, Texas, and we were able to bring 99 of them to Rock Prairie Baptist Church, and they were to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and their life was to be miraculously changed, do you know what would happen? We would have every Baptist fellowship in the nation, probably across the world, seeking us out, wanting us to know, how did you do it? How did you get 99 out of 100? I got news for you. TBN would give us a special spot. People would be singing the acclaim of Rock Prairie Baptist Church because we had secured 99 out of 100. But listen to me this morning, that's not good enough in God's lost and found. This story tells us that he leaves the 90 and 9 and goes to look for the one lost sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. And he'll secure them at all costs. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they fainted, because they were scattered abroad, because they were like sheep that had no shepherd. I find it interesting that the religion of men is always trying to get to God. <laughs> and God's all about getting to me. Isn't that wonderful? You remember the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11? They said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Mankind is always looking for a boost from beneath. But my God supplies a birth from above. Amen? We don't need a boost from beneath. We need a birth from above. Amazing grace how sweet the sound. We talked about the author in last week's message. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Thank God for his lost and found. Amen? God's love, it's a seeking love. But the story of the lost coin lets us know that not only is God's love a seeking love, but God's love is a sweeping love. We see it in verse 8. What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house diligently until she find it? The very act of sweeping involves cleaning. Cleaning dust, cleaning debris. It must be removed and put out of the way. It involves collecting the rubbish that's on all, all around, that has to be discarded. And it's about conserving those things that are valuable and preserving them in the cleaning process. When we sweep, we stir up the dust. We move the dust of contention away from our life. We move the dust of guilt and shame away from our life. And we allow the valuable coin to be found. Sweeping. We see God's love in his Holy Spirit broomstick. Amen? He sweeps our impurities. He gathers our guilt. He preserves our identity in him. The Holy Spirit convicts us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 says, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power. It came in power and in the Holy Spirit. And look at this, full of conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts us but it also convinces us. I'm thankful it convinces us. It lets us know, without a shadow of a doubt, His willingness. 2 Peter 3.9 says, But His long-suffering toward us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has a willingness. And I'm glad to be convinced of His willingness. But the Holy Spirit also convinces us of His willfulness. 
John chapter 6 verse 40 says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Praise God for his willingness and his willfulness. It's all part of his lost and found. There's a story about an airline pilot that was forgetful. He was a very good pilot, but when he came home and during his off time when he wasn't flying, he had a tendency to misplace things in the house. And he came home one time and he couldn't find the salt in the kitchen. And it drove him crazy. And he had went through every cabinet, every counter, every place he knew to look for the salt. And finally he said, honey, what did you do with the salt? And she looked at him and she said, dear, listen, how is it that you can find Detroit in a blizzard, but you can't find the salt in your own kitchen. The pilot looked at his wife and he said, Honey, they don't move Detroit. Right? They don't move Detroit. Sometimes life moves us. Life moves around us. And we can get lost. God's love is a seeking love. God's love is a a sweeping love. But lastly, this morning, God's love is a securing love. In verse 13, and not many days after the young son gathered, we see this in the story of the son of the prodigal son. The younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. This passage of scripture tells me without a doubt Sin will always take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you always more than you want to pay. Life of willful waste is a life of woeful want. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are from whom you obey. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 2 says, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which satisfieth not? There's some lost sons in the house today. There's some lost silver in this house today. There's some lost sheep in this house today, and I want you to know God's lost and found is looking for you. He's seeking. He's sweeping. He's looking to secure your life. Pay attention to the father's actions in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But look at this. When he was yet a great way off. Oh, the father saw him. And scripture says he had compassion on him. And he ran and he met him. And he grabbed him and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Wow. Notice five redeeming attributes about the Father in this passage of Scripture. The Father was festive. He was filled with joy. But not only was he festive, he fitted him. Verse 22 says, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. The son's carnage of a sin-filled life was covered. And loved ones by the same token. The blood of Christ Jesus is a robe that covers our body and covers our carnage and covers all of our sin. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all, all, there's that word again, all sin. He fitted Him. But then he forgave him. In verse 22 it says, And he put a ring upon his finger, and that ring signified the sonship was restored. But not only did he forgive him, then he fortified him. In verse 22, when he put shoes upon his feet, he was shod with strength and with stability. And then the father fed him. In verse 23, Bring hither the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and be merry. Look at the progression of the prodigal son in this passage. In verse 12, he was bad. In verse 13, he was mad. 
In verse 16, he was sad. But in verse 24, he was glad. Glad. God's lost and found. It's always working. It's always searching. It's always seeking. In closing this morning, there's a story of Robert Bruce, who was the king of Scotland in the 13th century. They were at war with England, and the king of England had sent an army to the palace of Robert Bruce with the express purpose of killing him. And the army, as it came upon the palace and went across the moat, was detected by one of the watchmen. And the watchman told Robert Bruce, and immediately Robert Bruce ran to the hidden escape chamber. And he was able to escape out of the back of the palace, and as he did, he ran through the woods. But the English army found his hunting dogs. You see, Robert Bruce was proud of a bevy of hunting dogs. And the English army was smart to put together the fact that his very own dogs would know his scent better than anybody would, and those dogs would track Robert Bruce down. And they set the dogs loose to find him. And Robert Bruce began to run, and he ran through the forest, and he ran, I feel like that old Confederate song, and he ran through the briars, and he ran through the brambles, and he ran through the bushes where a rabbit couldn't go. What was that, you know? Come on now. But the dogs were after him. And he heard the dogs, and he could tell by the way the dogs howled, they were his own dogs. And he knew that there was no way that he could ever hope to get away from his dogs, and he continued to run, but he continued to get weary, and he was getting weak, and he was getting tired, and he could hear the dogs coming before him and coming back behind him, and they're getting closer, and the howls are getting louder. And then he comes to a crystal river. And he immediately dives into the river and the current begins to carry him, a swift current in a crystal clear river that carried him downstream. And about two or three miles downstream, he could no longer hear the dogs. He was free. They could no longer find him. What's the application to our life in this story? I tell you this morning, if you're here and you're a lost sheep, if you're lost silver, if you're a lost son, and you're in need of God's seeking love and His sweeping love and His securing love, if you're hurting, if you're hapless, if you're hopeless, if the dogs of your past are on your trail, if those dogs of your past are in your mind, if you know those dogs of your past are in your path, I want to tell you this morning about a river. A crystal clear river. And you can jump into this river and it's filled with the blood of my crucified Savior. There's a fountain. It's filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all of their guilty stains. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's lost and found is open. God's lost and found is active. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, all we need to do is jump into that river, confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for your lost and found. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, that your presence here with us today already has lifted us and given us such strength. But Father, thank you also that you're always there for us and you're always seeking and you're always sweeping and you're always securing. Father, we need you. And I ask if there's one here this morning that the dogs of their past are haunting their present. 
Father, bring them to that crystal clear river that flows with your love and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness and have them come to you. And I ask it in the name of my risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.